I'm Claire Hubble, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we examine claims by Moscow that a Russian missile killed 600 Ukrainian soldiers in Krematorsk. And, as Britain considers sending Challenger 2 battle tanks to Ukraine, we analyse the latest weapons, tanks and military aid pledged by the country's allies. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Putin's war in Ukraine has destabilised energy markets the world over. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Monday, the 9th of January, day 320. And to discuss the most recent events in Ukraine and around the world, I'm joined by Associate Editor Dominic Nichols and Brussels correspondent Joe Barnes. I started by asking Dom for the latest updates from the front lines. Yeah, sure. Hi, Claire. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's good to be back. Happy New Year. Uh, most people have been at work for days, but I've only just got in, so it's still Happy New Year for me. Um, so in Ukraine, a number a number of things happening. Firstly, Joe can speak more about this in a, in a minute, but the the um, attack, Russia's attack in Krematorsk of a few days ago, where they claimed 600 Ukrainians uh, are being killed, is is crumbling or they, they, their suggestion the allegation is crumbling there's now pictures emerging um associated press report has been on the ground there uh, and there's reports that actually a four-story building that russia says was targeted um the four-story building is still standing windows blown in you know needs needs a good lick of paint but it's uh, it's still standing and there's no evidence of uh, that any building was struck and therefore where the 600 kia sort of killed in action came from is is not known um, there's uh, reporting from the ground showing shell craters in the locations where, they, where Russia says that these, these buildings were destroyed. So um, it's looking less and less likely that that attack did uh, have the effects that Russia says. Um, separately, Italy is, uh, is now not going to take a decision on the supply of new military uh, or new arms to Ukraine until February. They're saying because of political tensions, cost and military shortages. This is um, according to newspaper La Repubblica. They're saying that today. Now, this is, uh, this is on the back of a couple of weeks ago. President Zelensky um, said that Italy was considering supplying air defences um, following a, a phone call he had with, with the new Italian Prime Minister, Georgia Maloney, in which she reaffirmed her, her government's full support. That was a quote, full support for Ukraine. Now, after that, um, after that phone call and that quote of, of full support from uh, from Prime Minister Maloney, her defence minister Guido Crosetto, he, he he downplayed it. He struck a much more cautious tone on whether it is actually going to be able to supply air defence systems and really sort of backtracked. And they're now saying, like I say, Italy now saying that they're not, not going to make a decision until February. Now, there's a bit of a head of steam building up, which we'll talk about a bit later about supply of of weapons and ammunition um, i'm going to talk a little bit later uh, about the about friday's announcement from the biden administration the latest the latest tranche of of um of military aid but we'll come on to that shortly just other, a couple of other things on, on in in terms of news and then sort of headlines to bring up to speed on uh there's so imagery is on imagery on on social media showing that over the weekend uh hairs on residential areas of hairs on so down in the south southwest of the city uh, southwest of the country sorry that the city that russia evacuated uh, just before Christmas, came across the Dnipro River, setting up defensive lines on that uh, on the southern side of the of the river. Uh, images of of residential areas in the city being hit with incendiary ammunition on Sunday night, so last night. Now, Andre um, Zarogjunuk, apologies if I mispronounced that, who's a former defence minister, Ukraine defence minister. I think he left office in 2020. He's now an advisor to the government. He said that's a war crime because he's saying that Russian when when they pulled out, Russian forces destroyed or took with them all um, the firefighting vehicles and equipment. Um, they've uh, systemically bombed the fire stations up to and including a few days ago and now are using incendiary ammunition against residential areas. So so any use of ammunition against civilian areas is going to be a, a war crime. Incendiary ammunition is, is, is horrific. You know, it just, as as you'd expect, sets light to the whole place. But if it's premeditated and, they, and they've done this uh, having systematically eroded 
hairs on City's ability to to literally fight fires, then that's uh, that takes it to a whole a whole another league. Now, just while we're talking about war crimes, I just want to mention I just want to mention something because you may also see images going around social media of um, a film, a very short, just a few seconds, ten seconds or so of a film maybe if it looks like it's from a drone that starts on the ground and goes up so it gives you the the, the picture as it as it goes up and, and the picture we're we're presented with the viewer is presented with is of um probably half a sorry no about a dozen maybe maybe 15 um dead supposedly dead russian soldiers being laid out in a z shape obviously z the the, the symbol that russia has has adopted for their as their war motif now there's uh, no location, no date, no unit assigned to this to this imagery. However, it's generated a lot of discussion on social media about whether or not it's a, it's a war crime, and I just wanted to uh, just to raise it and and discuss it very very briefly. So so if you'll allow me, just for a, for a minute or so, let's have a look at the Geneva Convention signed um, 12th of August 1949, the end of the war. You know, Europe, Europe's ash. Um, the world comes together. It says we we can't do this never again. Um, so they said. Now. Convention 4 relates to the protection of civilians in a time of war and specifically Article 16, Paragraph 2. I'm getting specific for a reason, uh, but Paragraph 2 says the wounded and sick, as well as the infirm and expectant mothers, shall be the object of particular protection and respect. As far as military considerations allow, each party to the conflict shall facilitate the steps taken to search for the killed and wounded to assist the shipwrecked and other persons exposed to grave danger and to protect them against pillage and ill treatment, end of quote. The important bit there being the protect them against ill treatment. Now, you could argue that getting dead bodies and laying them out in a Z pattern, filming it, sticking on social media, is, is ill treatment. The question I raise here, that paragraph specifically relates to civilians. Now, let's, let's, let, we'll come on to the moral considerations in a moment, but, you know, does that, filming of dead Russians laid out in a Z shape constitute a breach of Article 16, Paragraph 2? Probably no, because that relates to civilians. So let's have a look at um, the Convention for Amelioration of the Condition of the Wounded Sick in in the Armed Forces in the field. Now, Article 17 is specifically covers prescriptions regarding the dead, and it says, quote, Parties to the conflict shall ensure that the dead are honourably interred, as if possible, according to their rights, the rights of the religion to which they belonged, that their graves are respected, grouped, if possible, according to the nationality of the deceased, properly maintained and marked so that they may always be found, unquote. Now, that relates to soldiers and serving personnel who are killed. And you will see that there's nothing in there that says anything about ill treatment. However, however, when it says... Um, Parties of the conflict shall ensure the dead are honourably interred. I mean, the whole the whole the feel of these of these conventions are that you should treat people alive or dead with with respect and honour. You should not you should not abuse them. You should not ill treat them, etc. Et so these are my words, but but you know this is what the I read the spirit of these of these conventions to be. So I, I think it is about uh, th- there's a lot of comment saying that people. Uh, or, or people who criticise this action, if if indeed it was, and you know, for the sake of argument, let's say yes, this was a Ukrainian drone filming uh, dead Russians. But there's a lot of people saying, "Oh, right, well, you care more about dead Russians than you do live Ukrainians." I think that debate is too binary. It too easily moves towards um, a kind of moral relativism, where where you're saying, "Oh, well, what they're doing is bad." Uh, oh, sorry, what I'm doing is bad, but it's not as bad as them. Uh, I mean, you know, that is not a position to take. I think you can have, you can hold the the two things in your head at the one time that. That what I think Russia is doing is is abhorrent um, and disgusting, uh, but also that their dead should not be ill treated. And like I said, there's nothing in in that Geneva Convention article specifically relating to uh, military personnel that that talks about ill treatment. That phrase rega- relates to civilians, but I think the the spirit of it is um, that it's clear that you should not you should not that this is this is a borderline. Um, disreputable act, whether it's a war crime or for other people you know, of a legal bent to to discuss. But I think we need to put this out there. Um, I, you know, I don't think anybody can categorically say it is a war crime. I don't think anybody can categorically state that it is not. It is entirely debatable. But I think from a moral point of view, it's it is distasteful. Um, it's not the kind of things I would want anybody um, that I had a, the privilege to command to be doing. 
uh, and I, I don't think it's particularly helpful. Um, end of. You know, the, the, I can't. I can offer nothing more than that. You'll, you'll see these images around social media if you look for them. Um, everyone's got an opinion, uh, and, and I think I, I would, I would urge you to discount the more extreme opinions because there is no black and white on this. I think I think the the way to look at it is, well, even if it doesn't state it in the Geneva Conventions. Is, is it a nice thing to do? Is it the kind of thing you want to inculcate in your forces as acceptable? Um, I, I would suggest it is not. Not the kind of thing I would, I would want to see. I'm going to take a pause there because I'm about to collapse. Um, and then we'll come back with more um, UK, uh, sorry, U, um, Ukraine uh, gifting, military aid for Ukraine. Thank you for that, Dom. And welcome back to the programme. Joe. I just wanted to come to you. Dom touched on the reports that a Russian missile hit and killed 600 Ukrainian soldiers. Could you just fill us in on, on the basics of this story? It's, it's a big one on the Ukraine news agenda this morning. What do we need to know about this story? Okay, and hi, hi everyone. Welcome back, Dom. It was um, in our newspaper this morning. James Kilner covered it, and I've hashed on a bit more of what we know and found out this morning for a web piece. But essentially, um, Russia and the Russian Ministry of Defence claimed to have killed 600 Ukrainian soldiers who were being temporarily housed in some student kind of college dormitories um, in the Donbass city of Kramatorsk. And to give you a kind of a bit of geo geographical sense of where Kramatorsk is, it's about an hour drive from Bakhmut where the heaviest fighting is. It's in Ukrainian held land in the Donetsk region. And it's, it's, it's where a lot of, um, journalists aid workers um and other people going into the kind of the deeper darker donbass region uh, are based so it's actually it's quite a populated area and what we've kind of learned now is um thanks to some journalists on the ground as uh, say as don mentioned associated press and there was also some reuters journalists who happened to be based there who managed to get to the scene after it at uh of this uh, missile or missiles had struck, um, but what Russia said it was a this was a retaliation uh, exercise where they were looking to kill Ukrainian soldiers in retaliation for the strike on Makvika on uh, just after midnight on New Year's Eve, and so uh, just to kind of throw ourselves back to to then is that's it's possibly the deadliest strike single strike. Um, in the war so far, um, Ukraine claims to have killed 400 Russian soldiers, while the Russian officials have given an actual unusually high death toll, saying that um, 89 of its troops were killed in this strike. And so then, now we fast forward to Kremotorsk. This is Russia claiming to have um, retaliated for that previous strike. Um, but the images we've seen... Um, they, it doesn't actually look like the dev same sort of devastation that we saw in Matvika um, at all. So um, the Reuters news agency copy makes makes clear there was no obvious signs that soldiers had been living in these two student dormitories. Um, there was no sign of bodies or traces of blood at the scene. Uh, this is this is what the Russian defence ministry had to say in quotation marks as a result of a massive missile strike on these temporary deployment points of the Ukrainian army units, more than 600 Ukrainian servicemen were destroyed. Um, the ministry, Russian ministry, added that the Moscow's forces had used reliable intelligence to target the Ukrainian troops, and it believed that there were 700 Ukrainian soldiers housed in one of these hostels, while there were 600 in another. But um, all of these claims by Russia have been um, denounced by Ukrainian officials. Um, so a spokesman for the Eastern Group of Ukraine's armed forces said it's nonsense. And he just says this is an information operation uh, by the Russian Defence Ministry. Um, Kremitorsk's mayor also claimed there were no casualties as a result of the strike. And he basically said the strike damaged two educational buildings and eight apartment buildings in the nearby area. Um, and obviously that's taking just either side's arguments on stories on this but if you actually look at the photos that reuters have published it shows a crater which is probably 12 feet maybe 15 20 feet at a push wide maybe six foot deep outside of the these buildings and these the 
the buildings look like they've been in the vicinity of a missile strike. The bottom row of the kind of debris strewn over the floor. The bottom row of windows are covered by some sort of chipboard, and then there are no kind of windows in the top three floors. Um, but as as Reuters reported, it doesn't actually look like there is any sign of kind of life being taken by these Russian missile strikes. So, um, and then there's some quotes that Reuters actually put out today for one from Polina, who is a 74 year old resident who actually lives across the road from one of these dormitories. She said uh, the attack was very loud. It threw people out of their beds. Some people hurt their fingers because of the blast waves. Um, and Mikhailo, a 41 year old resident of Krematorsk, he said there was an explosion, then another explosion. The windows shook. Really, nothing else to tell you. It was just a normal day. So, um, Actually, what we're probably seeing in is some sort of kind of Russian information warfare at a time when Vladimir Putin is desperate to control the narrative at home. Um, and there's kind of reports that he's looking to another one of these mobilizations of up to 500,000 troops. Um, he's, he's trying to control the sphere and basically make it look like Russia is having some successes and outdoing the Ukrainians in terms of striking uh at these kind of crucial points where soldiers are gathered and housed. But um, as far as I'm aware, and I can, using my kind of non-expertise when it comes to these kind of things, it doesn't look like anyone was hurt. Um, and the damage from the missile looked very, very, um, uh, very minimal. Minimal. So I, 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 I think this is safe to say that this is Russia trying to control the information sphere and putting out a bit of fake news by saying it's killed... 600 people um because it doesn't look like anyone's died at all and i'll leave leave it there for now dom if i can come back to you we're going to be looking at the most recent donations to ukraine in weapons tanks and military aid so if you could take us through sort of an overview of the most recent donations that we've seen this year and over this weekend even who are they coming from who is giving what and are we expected to hear any more announcements of aid and weaponry coming soon? Yeah, sure. So let's go back to Friday, just uh, just a couple of days ago. Um, President Biden's administration announced another three billion dollars in a military aid package that takes the US up to twenty four point two billion dollars in military aid to Ukraine since February the 24th. Um, now, after I mean, there's three basic packages. You've got the military stuff, you've got humanitarian supplies, and then just straightforward economic aid, as in loans, financial loans. So, But if you look at the military slice of that, then after the US, the next biggest donor, uh, not counting Russia, of military kit to Ukraine is Britain, uh, committed $2.3 billion in 2022. And Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has promised the same for 2023. There's been some recent moves from France and Germany, which I'll talk about in a moment. But let's have a look at this uh, Friday's uh, US announcement. So what they're going to send is uh, 50 Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicles, IFVs, very, very capable uh, vehicles. Come on in, in a sec. They're going to talk. Uh, they're going to send another 100 M113s. These are tracked uh, armoured personnel carriers, basically sort of you know, big arm armoured boxes on tracks. They're very old, but they get... Soldiers around the battlefield in relative, very relative safety. They can't they can't put up with an awful lot, but it's better than um, the uh, uh, LPCs or leather personnel carriers, as I was told, i.e. walking. Um, US is also going to be sending 55 MRAPs. These are wheeled vehicles, mine resistance, ambush protected MRAP, mine resistant ambush protected vehicles. So these these were brought in in Iraq and Afghanistan to put up with roadside bombs and improvised explosive devices and, and so on and so forth. So they're very they're, they're modern, but they're still only um, a kind of development of the 113, albeit on wheels, um, but very, very good for putting up with... They're, they're sort of V-shaped hulls, and they and the hull is about a metre or so off the floor. So so if a roadside bomb goes off, then the, a lot of the blast has dissipated by the time it hits the metal, and that is then shaped away from the main the main body of the vehicle by the V-shaped hull, and, um, and the, the soldiers inside should hopefully survive. Um, also sending 138 Humvees, high mobility, multi-purpose wheeled vehicles. I've spoken about these before. This is now this is now many many hundreds of Humvees that have been sent, and they are very capable wheeled vehicles again. So limited uh, to a certain degree about cross-country capability, but very very capable vehicles, and can be uh, compartmentalized. So you can use one for a command and control variant. You can use another one for um, 
uh, for a radio rebroadcast or other bits and pieces. So you can use them for different different purposes. US also sending 18 155 millimeter self-propelled howitzers, so big artillery pieces, plus their support vehicles and 70,000 uh, sort of normal, quote unquote, normal artillery rounds and 500 precision guided artillery rounds for those for those weapon systems. They're sending 36 105 mil towed artillery and, and a further 95,000 rounds. Uh, 105 mil towed artillery is quite old. You know, 105 is not not a massive caliber, and if it's towed, it, it you know it literally can't move itself. You've got to you've got to have other supporting vehicles to pull it around, so it's a bit more cumbersome. Doesn't get out the way very very quickly. And these days, you should expect to 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 be on the receiving end of fire within about three minutes. Um, of firing yourself so you know it's best to shoot and scoot to get the hell out of there so if you've got to tow this thing away it takes a while to hook that up and move so the older systems of, of towed artillery are, are going out of fashion and we, we, you want self-propelled vehicles these days um, that can that can fire and then move immediately they're also sending us also sending 10,000 mortar rounds 120 mil mortar rounds so these are big 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 mortar rounds 120 mil is basically the size of a tank main armament tank main armament uses generally one 120 125 mil rounds so these are big bombs big mortar rounds being sent and additional unspecified quantities of ammunition for high mars air defense and and other stuff so a big old a big old dump of military aid there from from the us again um now I'd like to have a quick look at um, the Bradley uh, Infantry Fighting Vehicle the US is sending, also the Marder that the Germans are sending, and the AMX-10 that French that, that the French have said they'll send. Before we do that, let's have a, let's have a quick talk about tanks. This gets loads of journalists bent around the axle about what is a tank, what is not a tank. If it's you know big and it's green, it's called a tank for for shorthand in journalism world, which gets a lot of military purists um, up in arms. So generally, when you think about tanks and how to classify these things, the, 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 there's a number of big differences. So is it on tracks? Is it on wheels? So tracks can pretty much go go most places. There's very few areas that uh, of ground that a, a tracked vehicle cannot cover. Um, wheeled vehicles will slip and slide in certain uh, in certain situations, such as uh, the Rasputitsa that we're seeing in, in Ukraine now. That that uh, well, we're just sort of passing out of it. I think the big, wet, heavy, cloying mud, the thick mud as it transitions from from uh, seasons into win- into and out of winter. So wheeled wheeled vehicles can be quite vulnerable to that and slip around all over the place. Whereas tracked vehicles are much better, much better able to to cross that kind of kind of ground. However, tracks are high on maintenance, so we- wheels are much much easier to look after. So when you're talking about the whole system. Wheels might be more preferable to to tracks. Also, uh, in the debate about is it a tank or not a tank, look at the armor. So, if the armor is on the on the vehicle is is such that it's able to withstand a modern tank gun or a modern modern anti tank missile, then that probably is sort of veering towards tank territory. Less than that, if it can't with its main armor, and the main armor on the tank is 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 at the front on the on the hull and on the turret that's generally the bit you point towards the enemy so that's where you expect the rounds to come in from you can't cover the whole tank in um, in armor because it just simply won't move um, so generally the main armor main armor is at the front and if that can put up with a modern tank round then yes you're probably you know fair to describe the vehicle as, as a tank and separately the main armament so is it designed to kill other tanks has it got a turret that can move independently of the hull or has it got to uh, has it got to shift the entire vehicle to point the weapon where where it needs to go can it fire on the move stabilized as in so you you're more likely to hit what you what you're trying to on the move or you just sort of bang banging the rounds down range and hoping that it that it um, that it achieves something is the vehicle designed to be in that direct fire battle to get in close with the enemy and by close i mean sort of you know the, the last few hundred meters onto a position and take take rounds incoming rounds and still survive and, and fight so all those things together and the question is it a tank is it not a tank you know the debates will, will run on endlessly however um you know you you could then qualify and, and people sort of talk about light tanks and medium tanks and it's just a way of saying i don't really know but is it a tank i'm not sure but let's have a look at the, the bradley so bradley is a an infantry fighting vehicle um it's been upgraded many times since it was brought in in the well, it was late 80s, early early 90s. 
Um, the Bradleys are going with 500 tow missiles. Tow is tube-launched, optically tracked, wire-guided missile, so an anti-tank missile that, that fires off downrange and trails a wire behind it. The wire spools out from the missile, so it's not it's not sort of under under tension. It just it it, it is um, you know, it comes out the back of the missile, and and the commander or the or the or the gunner in the in the Bradley and other vehicles that use tow, we used to fire tow from Lynx helicopters, for example, you know, you, you are sending information down that fiber optic cable to the, to the missile itself, so the tracking information and, and steering it onto the target. Um, now, the, the downside of that is that you have to expose yourself or at least your sight so you can see the, uh, you can see the, you can see the, the, the target and in in a Lynx helicopter I seem to remember at maximum range the uh, it would take 21 and a half seconds for the tow missile to, to reach its maximum range and you know I would not be not want to be in the hover for 21 and a half seconds having having launched something at um, at the enemy so there's a, a bit of a downside to these these missiles that are not far and forget um, that 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 can seek, seek the enemy out for themselves uh, but still a very very capable weapon so 500 tow missiles are going and 250,000 rounds of 25 mil ammo 25 mil being the main gun on a bradley ukraine's likely to get the m2a2 version these were so there a load of bradleys were upgraded after operation desert storm which was gulf one in in 1990 91 um, there were just over 1,400 upgraded to the M2A2 version. So that's that's the, the cohort that's going to be sending these 50 to Ukraine. And they're upgraded with a laser rangefinder, uh, a GPS global positioning system, uh, a combat identification system to hopefully cut down on blue on blue. So your own side shooting shooting you. Uh, had a thermal viewer for the for the driver. So so good upgrades. As I say, it's got a 25 mil main armament and a coaxially mounted 7.62 millimeter machine gun. Coaxially mounted means it's it's alongside the main gun, and where the main gun points, so does the so does the machine gun. And the machine gun's there for for taking on personnel and that and that kind of thing. Uh, Brad does have two tow missile launchers on top of the uh, on top of the vehicle, which importantly can be fired by the gunner and the commander inside. They don't have to get out of the turret. Which I'll talk about in a moment with the with the Marder. They don't have to get out of the turret, expose themselves when they fire this fire this missile. So so the tow launchers can be fired from inside. Crew of three, and it can fit six infantry in the back. It's about thirty tons. Now all the vehicles are uh, in storage in the U.S. No, although no new Bradley has been made after 1991, they've all been refurbished and upgraded. Um, so there's no no real delay on these. These fifty should be should be moving very very soon. And all all round. They are. It's a. It's a very good, a very good weapon system. Very good vehicle. Um, anecdotally, from Gulf One, the the Bradley's main armament, uh, armor piercing twenty five mil uh, rounds were able to uh, knock out, destroy Russian T seventy two tanks, or the the, the the Iraqi army was using. So very very capable um, vehicle. Can see in the dark clearly. And and a very capable um, tank busting main gun. Is it a tank? Don't know. You know, park, park that park that thought for one moment. But a very very capable um, vehicle. Uh, now Russian systems have not been upgraded. They've, they've gone through certain upgrades, of course. I mean that's why we've moved from BMP one to two to three and so on and so forth. They've been upgraded slightly, but but nothing like the upgrades that Western kit generally has. So these Bradleys in particular are going to be. Um, yeah, I hate using the phrase battle winning because it depends what the battle is and what the other side have got. But you know, they are very, very capable. Separately, last Friday, Germany said 40 Marder vehicles were going to be sent to Ukraine. So the Marder 1A3 variant. So uh, uh, an upgrade from the original Marder ones. So pretty old, uh, but still very useful, very good. It's got, um, it's got better optics, better communications than most of the uh, IFVs, the infantry fighting vehicles that, that Ukraine's using now. Uh, the first upgrade of this of this type, one A three, was was done in nineteen eighty nine. So you know, pretty old, but the um, the and and it is it's used as a, it's the current standard IFE for Germany. Although they're upgrading to a new vehicle called Puma in the next few years. Uh, Marder's got a twenty mil main armament, still a seven point six two coax main gun, uh, so coaxially mounted machine gun. It fires Milan anti tank missiles, a very good missile anti tank missile. But the commander has to get out of the turret to fire that missile which you know if you've got artillery bursting around you and, and troops trying to shoot at you is not is not the place to be similar to bradley crew of three infantry you can fit six of them in the back same weight about 30 tons same as bradley so so good i mean way 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 out of the league of 
know, it, it's better than nothing. I mean, it's it's a very, very good vehicle, better than what Ukraine's probably got at the moment with its BMP and BTR, but uh, but still fairly old. Then we come on to France. So France has said they're going to send a number of uh, AMX 10s uh, or AMX 10 RCR for uh, for completion. They are good. These are these are these are wheeled vehicles um, with a 105 mil main gun. Uh, which is not stabilized, so it can't fire on the move, or if, or if it can, you know, you're not going to hit a barn door. Uh, but it's, you know, it, in a static position, it, it's maneuverable, especially on tracks, because I say it's wheeled, um, and it's got a pretty good gun. So 105 is, is not, a, you know, a, it's very good to have that uh, in support of you. Bearing in mind, like I say, the Bradley's got a, a 25 mil main gun, so 105 mil is, is obviously much bigger, um, but it has certain has certain drawbacks. About 20 tons, a uh, crew of four. But, you know, a good vehicle, good vehicle for kind of supporting the assault. So all these vehicles, the, the Bradley, the Marder, the AMX-10, they were all designed in the Cold War to defeat Soviet armour and defensive positions. That's what they were, that's what they were procured for. We then got, you know, we, we all got sidetracked or um, we ran off to uh, dusty places for, for 20 odd years. But, you know, we're now back to doing what these vehicles were, were designed for. And it, they worked in the Gulf. Bradley was knocking out T-72 in the Gulf. 25mm ammo, armour-piercing, was going through the tank hull. The tow were destroying um, the turrets. It, it was the, the old turret-throwing contest all over again. So you can imagine a scenario where you've got, perhaps you've got AMX-10 off to a flank, firing 105mm high explosive into a Russian position, whilst Bradleys are firing tows to knock out any tanks. On the, on the position, and they and the Marder are, are pushing for delivering troops into the contact battle, you know, protecting those troops and keeping the enemy distracted for that last critical four six hundred meter distance as you race onto the onto the enemy objective, uh, enemy position, and the troops in the back are in are in relative safety to get to the get to the position and then start fighting through um, in good order. So they've not been too um, messed about before they even get to get to the position which is obviously what you want so these are very very capable now britain has been sending um the old what they call the dogs of war the huskies the wolfhound the mastiff and the coyote these vehicles that the protect protected um, mobility vehicles that were brought in in iraq and afghanistan so so not infantry fighting vehicles but just protecting the crew there's been a lot of debate about you know britain should send its uh, some of its fleet of challenger two main battle tanks should send some of the warriors that have been taken out of out of service what you know, very very broadly warriors a bradley equivalent ish although it doesn't have a tow missile um there's that debate is raging at the moment the most i can get out of gov- government at the moment is quote they or they are quote considering unquote sending challenger 2 i've i you know I'm reading the runes i think something's going to change there but you know i can offer nothing more than that that's the quote i've been given they are considering sending Challenger two, um, and that and that reflects a comment that James Cleverly, the Foreign Secretary, said earlier in the week. There's a debate whether or not Poland and the Czech Republic should be able to um, send Leopards, Leopard two, which is a very very capable main battle tank um, that are made by Germany, and because of the contractual arrangements with these things, Germany has the say so over where those vehicles eventually end up. There's pressure on Germany now to allow. Poland and Czech Republic to release Leopard 2s for use in Ukraine. Um, hitherto, it's been deemed you know, these big main battle tanks. Um, it's well over the offensive defensive line. If you choose to use that, I don't. I don't particularly like that as a as a self imposed construct. Um, as I've said before, you can't be can't be a little bit pregnant. You're either in it or you're not. Um, but yeah, this this is the debate that currently is holding back the Leopard 2s or Germany allowing Poland and Czech Republic to, to send the Leopard 2s. But all in all, things are moving on the armoured front. So like I say, Bradley, Marder, AMX-10 are going. They're all very, very capable vehicles, the Bradley especially. And um, it, we're not, I don't think it will take very long to train Ukrainian crews up to use these things. And the more heat there is at the moment pushing uh, international partners to send this, this heavy armour whether or not it's a tank, and you know, we can, like I say, the endless endless debate, um, but it is all these are all designed to um, take and hold ground uh, along with your infantry. Armor and vehicles can't do it on their own. Obviously, you need a load of infantry to actually physically hold the ground to stay there on the ground and, and own it. Um, but it looks as if 2023 is starting with the international community moving from supporting Ukraine with enough 
weapons not to lose and morphing now into supporting Ukraine with enough weapons to win. I mean, a bit of a glib phrase, um, maybe a bit too binary. And, and as you know, I don't I don't particularly like binary positions, but that I see is where the debate is at the moment. We're starting to move through that looking glass into actually really, really capable, modern um, e- equipment that is going, to, is going to ramp up Ukraine's offensive capability. Yeah, thank you for that, Dom. You went to great lengths there to explain what makes a tank a tank. Why does the definition of a tank versus an armoured vehicle matter so much in this context? Well, I mean, it, it doesn't really. I mean, it matters if you were if you're on the phone or, or bidding on eBay trying to buy some of these things and say, oh, no, I've I've bought an APC, not an IFE or a PPM. I wanted a tank. You know, it, it doesn't really matter. It gets doctrinal purists bent around the axle. Um, but it, 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 you know, it's not, it doesn't massively uh, matter that much. I think what it comes down to is, is how you then explain how these things can be used and, um, and what it enables a force to do. And of course, as, as I've just said, tanks or infantry fighting vehicles, armoured personnel carriers, protected uh, mobility vehicles um, on their own can't do anything they've got a working consort with the infantry and the artillery and the engineers and the signals and and everyone else um to actually have a have a real effect um so it, in and of itself doesn't really matter but when you start thinking about what they are you that that is the important bit to focus on and it's also important to focus on their vulnerability because just saying oh you're going to send the the, the most modern stuff it's like well they're not invulnerable nothing is invulnerable um, some of these things will get knocked out or they will fall in a bog or they will throw a track and won't be able to move anywhere. Um, so, you know, it's as important to know what the vulnerabilities are as well as as well as how, how good they can be. But, you know, the, the actual debate of is it a tank or is it not um, is, a, is a murky world. Um, and you, you dip your toe into that debate on social media um, at, at your peril because <laughs> people, people get very heated on these things. Thanks, Dom. A question for you, Joe. What are your thoughts on Britain's donations to Ukraine and how do they fare compared to the rest of Europe? It's it's an interesting subject now um, because under Boris Johnson, um, I think it's safe to say that we were genuinely Europe's leader in terms of giving military kit and pushing the boundaries of what was given. We while France and Germany were still uncertain of whether Vladimir Putin was going to send his troops across the border, we were sending in soldiers to help train Ukrainians. We were sending in these anti-tank weapons um, to basically to equip Ukraine for the initial defence. And then we slowly ramped it up to the point where we were giving over so air defence more recently, but we, we gave our version of the MLRS, the multi-launch rocket system, over. Um, but that does seem to be dwindling a tad. Um, And I was kind of as France and Germany were announcing they were giving over Marders and AMX 10 Rs, um, RC, sorry. um, I started to look in about how the numbers were changing and uh, the Kiel Institute, a German based think tank, uh, the Kiel Institute for the world economy had basically been tracking commitments and donations to Ukraine over uh, the course of the war and their kind of most up to date comprehensive figures which don't doesn't include what has been given and offered by France and Germany in in terms of these whether we call it mini tanks or infantry fighting vehicles um has actually shown Germany and France um their overall contribution which includes their contributions to the EU's uh support for Ukraine of now overtaking Britain so Germany's commitments, and this was a, a tweet put out in December by the Kiel Institute, so Germany's new commitments and its contributions to the new EU package now make it the lar- largest donor in Europe in absolute terms, overtaking the UK for the first time. And it basically charts Germany's contribution um, at 12.6 billion euros. And a large part of that is the fact that Germany is the EU's largest contributor uh, to the EU budget and France is the second largest. So actually with the EU's package of support, France and Germany, while their bilateral support isn't as big as Britain's, um, they've actually now overtaken Britain in terms of absolute donations. And and I, I, I 
wrote a piece with Nick Gutteridge, uh, one of our political correspondents, the other day, looking into why this has happened. Um, and Rishi Sunak wants one of the criticisms of him is he's uh, probably more frugal when it comes to the economy. He's not Boris Johnson. He's he's vowed to support Ukraine for as long as it takes, and he's he's promised to match the um, military contribution of 2022 in 2023, and or match or even go past it. Um, but there was never there's never a definitive answer. No one really says. And uh, we spoke to Tobias Elwood, who is the chair of the Commerce Defence Committee, and he um, he said actually. The idea of France and Germany sending in Marders and AMX tens um, is a welcome one, um, and but he then said Britain should go further, bolster its to take up the leading role in Europe again. And he and he he told us that we need a better coordinated approach if we are serious about arming Ukraine to fight Russia. Ultimately, they need main battle tanks. Um, if we are going to be serious about this, why aren't we sending main battle tanks and why aren't we enabling Ukraine to strike legitimate targets inside Russia's borders? So we have put limitations on what we can actually do. Um, we've been we've been hesitant, um, but he does he does say like each each month we be, become less risk averse in what we're willing to send and being a little bit more confident. So there's there's no reason why we can't start sending kind of our main battle tanks, which are Challenger twos. Um, and Richard Drax, he is a Tory MP and a member of the Commons Defence Committee. He told us that look, if Germany and the Americans are up for sending are up in up in the ante by sending more offensive weapons that's great news like it's, um and then he goes on to say like if their contribution is something like armored vehicles i don't necessarily think that means we have to give that as long as ukraine gets the weapons they need that's the main thing so it it's not seen in kind of political circles as a challenge to kind of outdo uh, what france and germany are doing but the seen as kind of everyone should move in a bit of a lock step in terms of sending equipment um and britain can and can continue to play a leading role um so as don mentioned uh last week when the german foreign minister was over in town annalena baerbock um she gave a press conference alongside james cleverly and he he gave a nod to say that look tanks are something that we're considering um dom's obviously spoken about challenge to twos being a consideration and Sky News is Deborah Haynes has just uh, put out a report while we're live on air suggesting that these conversations have been going on for weeks and we could send up to, up to as many as 10 Challenger 2 tanks uh, to Ukraine that would, which would, I believe would form a squadron. Um, and that actually then helps build in. There's a, there's a, a meeting of the US-led Ramstein initiative, which is the American attempt to speak to. It's about made up of about 50 countries. Um, and it's a, a program where they hold regular meetings of defence ministers and officials to try and basically coordinate Western uh, support for Ukraine. Uh, and it's made up of about 50 countries. They are meeting again at the end of, uh, I think in about a week's time, I think the 20th uh, off the top of my head. Um, so that gives a chance for the Germans to say, look, we're happy for Leopard 2s to be sent, so the Czechs, the Poles, uh, the Finns have also said that they would they would be happy to do so, but obviously need that kind of export declaration, export license from the Germans. Um, could the Leclerc be sent by the French? Could an Ab Abrams be sent by the Americans? Possibly. So if Britain is to stick its head above the parapet and say we're sending a main battle tank, um, we could we could take up our our role as the leading country in Europe when it comes to supporting Ukraine. Um, but I think as it stands at the moment, the French and the Germans, with their kind of contribution to the EU side of things, have actually overtaken us in in real terms money. So um, it's up for kind of a decision by Rishi Sunak, by Ben Wallace, uh, by kind of our military chiefs about how much money we can uh, spare. Can we spare any more kit? And I know one of the, one of the things that Ben Wallace has spoken about is... Um, and he, um, I can't remember what it was, potentially June, May time, we was, we sat down for a, a brief chat and he he described the uh, the solution for helping Ukraine as not just a, as, a, as a kind of a, a recipe book. So he suggested that we've given Ukraine a lot of the ingredients, but now we need to teach them how to use them to, to fight against Soviet armour. 
um, which I think would be probably the Ukrainians would say is condescending at the moment because they're doing pretty well in claiming back land and uh, they're the most well-trained and they have the most experience when it comes to fighting a Soviet uh, land army. So um, that's that's one thing to consider is how much kit have we actually got on the shelves that we're willing to, to donate. But I think bon a signaling that we're willing to give Challenger 2s across, that will open and unlock a lot of doors um, when it comes to Ukraine being given of a main battle tanks by the French, by the Germans, by the Americans. Because um, I think the Poles, the Czechs, have given over their Soviet-era tanks, um, which were backfilled by Western NATO standard tanks in their own countries for defensive purposes. But we've not got as far as sending a proper NATO standard Western main battle tank. So I think if Britain, with the Challenger 2, um, nod, that will help grease the wheels or grease the grease the tracks of getting main battle tanks to Ukraine. But as it as it stands, the French and the Germans have in real terms sent more money, monetary um money worth of kit, as value of kit and support to Ukraine and Britain is falling behind. So it's a it's a decision that for Britain's politicians and military chiefs to decide whether they want to donate further and actually outdo the Germans and the French in terms of monetary value of support. But I'll stop there for now. A question for both of you, perhaps you would like to answer first, Dom. It seems the latest donations are a marked upgrade in the kit provided by the West to Ukraine. In your assessment, is that true? And once all of the pledged donations are delivered to the country, will Ukraine be better equipped than Russia? Um, OK, is it a marked upgrade? Individually, yes. I mean, it, the the individual unit individual vehicles that we're talking about here are just are just out out of any league comparison with the the infantry fighting vehicles that Russia is fielding the BMP the, the Boyevaya Machina Picotti the, the the well they've been upgraded but they are fairly fairly old and the BTR the the Bronny transporter the people transporters their tanks are quite old T72s there's some T80s there's even been rumors of T90s in there but you know they they they're fairly old they're in, in small in small numbers but uh, so yes one for one all this equipment all these vehicles are much better than anything that they might be compared against in the russian inventory um now numbers they 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 we're not entirely sure how many i mean russia's raiding museums and 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 old old equipment the, the equipment locker to get stuff out for this we've seen t64 which as the name suggests was designed in the 60s i mean very very old bits of kit um but but they i mean they, they're going down that line of mass russia is going down the line of mass rather than um particularly nimble and, and efficient capability but so even if you even if you equate the mass thing or you take on the mass thing and say oh well you know ukraine still might not uh, might not be might not be able to affect a, uh, a great breakthrough on the on the battlefield I mean, just having the stuff is only one small part of fielding a capability. And, I, you know, it's, we're getting on a bit now in, t in terms of time. We've covered it before. Maybe we'll do a, we'll do again about the, the British military way of, of when you trans when you move from having kit to capability. And the and the, the mnemonic was tepid oil. So you need training, equipment, personnel, information, doctrine, organizations infrastructure and logistics you need to tick all those boxes you need to have the the places to train on them you need to have the the, the warehouses to look after this equipment properly you need to have the doctrine you need to know how you're actually going to employ it when it comes to the comes to the fight so just having the the thing that the 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 tank or the vehicle if you like out on the tank park is is good but you know if you can't equip it if you can't if you can't put the, the correct personnel inside it who know what they're doing and if they can't work together as a team like i say you know bradley's got a crew of three the same same with marder amx 10's got a crew of four you know they're not all doing individual jobs completely uh, not not talking to each other of course they're not they're, they're all talking to each other the whole time the commander is trying to direct the driver he's trying to tell the gunner what to aim at he's trying to he's on the radio to his higher command to say you know what where the fight's going he's on the radio as well to the infantry in the back and the infantry outside say where, where, where's the tank where's that where's that depth position that's suddenly started opening up on me so you know the commander's got a lot going on the gunner is bouncing around he or she is trying to trying to aim the aim the gun get the correct round down range at the correct target etc etc the driver's wondering what the hell is going on and, and and where where are they aiming the the vehicle and so on and so forth that's just inside one vehicle multiply that across well in the british army 12 12 vehicles make a um, make a squadron 
you normally have about three in a troop, and then you have four, tro- yeah, three troops and a and a and a squadron headquarters that are in the in three vehicles themselves. So about twelve for a squadron, three squadrons ish make up a make up a regiment. So you know, you've got all these building blocks that all have to knit together. And like I say that's that's the vehicles with the infantry and with the artillery, and you know, you're timing your running because you're you're going to have the artillery landing on the enemy position as you're as you're covering those last few hundred meters because you want them to get their heads down so you can get there. And start start killing them before they before they even know you're there, basically. But at, at what point do you do, do you lift that artillery curtain, or you know do, you've got to trust your artillery mates that they're that they're going to put them on the put the rounds on the on the correct place and at the correct time and stop and stop dropping rounds the moment you get there because you don't want rounds coming down while your infantry are getting out the back of your vehicle. So this whole orchestra, I keep talking about this, the combined arms. Um, nature of warfare it's everything working together in concert so just having these vehicles um, is, is one one good part and yes they are better than anything Russia is fielding today but it's how you get it all working together and that's what really um, that's what really brings that effect um, and without that then you could very very as good as these vehicles are if you just put them in piecemeal and they're not supported and they're going in the wrong direction as I say you've only got the, the, the most amount of armor at the front you can bolt on armor to the sides and the turret and do whatever you like, but the thing's not going to move if you put too much of it on there. So if you don't use them correctly, then they will get knocked out. I mean, you know, Bradley's were the vast, vast, vast majority of, of, of Bradley's um, came out of Gulf One intact. I think the, the U.S. lost, I think, 20 of which um, high double figures was was due to friendly fire. That that problem hopefully has now been um, superseded with combat identification systems and so on and so forth. But there were some. A very small number, it has to be said, but there were some Bradleys knocked out by uh, by the Iraqi army. It is going to happen, so you've got to be very clever, and that's when you when you are overwhelmingly um, you overwhelmingly own the violence, basically. But even then, you're you're going to lose some. So if you go into it piecemeal and you go into it with with too little thought given to how you're actually going to employ this, then you will lose more of them, and you'll you'll lose your own people. And uh, just as important as the capability of the vehicle and the individual crews working together is the confidence of the men and the women that you are putting in harm's way and asking to to get up close and personal with the enemy. And once their confidence goes, then everyone's a little bit hesitant, and it just doesn't go off. Now, the, the attack just doesn't quite work, and it's a it can be a it can be a it can snowball into in into, into sort of paralysis, if you like. So, you know, you can have the best equipment in the world, but if you don't use it right, then you, you, you're on a hiding to nothing. And over to you, Joe, what's your analysis of the same question? Um, I think Dom's covered it quite um, in depth there. I don't really need to add a lot, but say um, the, training's a big, the training's a big part of this. Um, we believe the Germans are going to, well, and they have been, they've been training Ukrainian soldiers on their territory to use their air defence systems that they've donated, um, the IRIS systems. Um, and it will be the same with uh, whatever Britain ends up giving over. We'll train uh, Ukrainians, the Americans the same, the French the same. That's It's an, an important, um, it's an important aspect of whether, yeah, we can, we can keep uh, training their soldiers to use and it's what it's what ben wallace alluded to when i was speaking to him all those months ago if you can it's all well and good having the um having like the ingredients to make a five star kind of michelin star meal um but if you don't have the skills and the know-how to to craft it you're not going to be as good as gordon ramsay um so i think that's a really important important element to take in into account there and the ukrainians i think every day are surprising sort of western military experts um and with what they can do and their, their ability to use the, the capabilities given to them by Western governments, NATO um, countries, etc. So I think, yeah, it's a, to, to kind of that's an important, important bit to keep looking at is how how much training, how much um, no knowledge and know how is being imparted on the Ukrainian troops when they're given these bits of kit. And how many how many how many people can they spare to be sent for training? Because uh, they obviously need their soldiers on the front line to carry on taking back territory and defending Uh, where the Russians are trying to push forward. I'll stop there. We're coming to the end of our time this afternoon. So if we can come to everybody's final thoughts. Over to you first, Dom. What would you like to leave our listeners with this afternoon? Well, I'd just keep a focus on this this debate about about armour specifically now, not just um, weapons and munitions and aid for Ukraine, but specifically armour, tanks, 
back to whatever you what decide a tank is. I think that is a that's coming to a head here in the UK. I think there's going to be some um, some moves in the next couple of days or, um, announcements. I don't know. I've got I've got I'm not I'm not trying to set anything up here. Like I said, I spoke to Emily this morning and I had the word considering, which has been out out for a few days now anyway. So you know, I'm not trying to set myself up as some great sage. I genuinely don't know, but I think I get the. I've been sniffing the wind. I probably could have chosen a better expression, and I and I think something is something's going to happen this week in in the UK specifically about about armour, um, and I think it comes back to as I said earlier, I, I do think there's been a shift now from is is the West just trying to stop Ukraine losing to is it trying to enable Ukraine to win? And I think we're through that looking glass. Right, and over to you, Joe. What are your final thoughts? Dom has actually stolen my well, not stolen. How could he? How could he know? But I was, ha ha! I was going to say, I think we've had a, a, a kind of a, a very distinctive shift um, where finally we've got some of maybe Europe's doubters. Um, France, Emmanuel Macron was always looking to limit what he gave to Ukraine because he wanted to keep a, a sort of a, a window, uh, an opportunity for dialogue open with Vladimir Putin. He always spoke about not wanting to humiliate the Russian leader, but now he's saying uh, he's changed his tone to saying we'll. We'll back um, a Ukrainian victory um, on the battlefield, which is a uh, good news for the Ukrainians. So I think we're actually coming to a, a head with um, everyone is on board with making sure Ukraine wins. And I think that what's played a big part in that is the fact of Vladimir Putin, the Russian army is targeting more and more civilian kind of infrastructure in terms of heating and electricity and basically trying to, we spoke, we speak about it a lot, kind of torture and plunge the ukrainians into a, a horrible horrible winter um which is that's good news but then I'll, I'll also i think we should look forward to um whether it be in the next days weeks or months uh the ukrainian intelligence are talking about uh, vladimir putin doing another round of uh mobilization of troops and they the ukrainians think up to five hundred thousand russians could be conscripted and uh, brought into the army um and put into some sort of springtime counteroffensive. So whether it be uh, March, uh, April time, the Ukrainians seem to think that they are um, pre- the Russians are preparing for a counteroffensive. So I think that's what we've got to start looking forward to in the future. And whether the Ukrainians are correct on that, or whether it's an an opportunity for for them to put pressure on Western governments to give over more aid, um, that wouldn't surprise me. Um, but I think yeah, the um, Winter has been obviously a bogged down period. We get into kind of we're coming into February. We'd be at the one year anniversary of of the conflict in uh, just over a month. Um, but I, I I would expect kind of the the conflict to go from more static and grinding to some kind of more offensive postures. So let's let's look out for that. And if um, the West can get main battle tanks over in time for March, I know the Germans suggest they might get their forty Marders over by March but if we can start getting battle tanks over there that will help uh, Ukraine drastically as the weather conditions improve so uh, yeah let's let's look at the shifting kind of weather and shifting attitudes from the west um, in terms of helping out Ukraine win the war and I'll stop there Ukraine the latest is an original podcast from the Telegraph To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk slash audio. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings you stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, and today on Twitter, Robbie Nichols.